Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord, church. I want you to do me a favor. Before we do anything else, just take a moment and just say, thank you, Lord. Take a moment and just say, hallelujah. Take a moment and just say, thank you, Jesus. Take a moment and just say, glory to God. Take a moment and just give God praise, give Him gratitude, and give Him thankfulness for everything that He has done because He is worthy of the praise. He is able to do so much and more. Every now and then we get a little comfortable. We got a little comfortable. But I want you to make yourself just a little bit uncomfortable for me. And just give God praise. Whether you're in the car, whether you are at home, you're on the couch, you're in your bed, wherever you are. You're listening to this out here on the street. I need you to just give God a shout of praise for who he is. Not for what he's done, but for who he is. Don't bless him for his head, bless him for his face, but who he is.
e assim dizer em nome. The Jews say he's able to keep you from falling. He's able to present your faultless before the presence of his father. Oh, he's able to provide a way out of no way. He's able to heal even the sickest body and the most sensitive soul. He's able. Father, we come right now. Acknowledging that you are the able God, uh, the one who has delivered us and continue to deliver us from evil. We thank you. We magnify the name we lift up your son, Jesus. We thank you for yet another privilege just to be here. And now we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight. For oh Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. I want to Start by thanking all of the well wishes, all of the kind thoughts, blessings, and prayers, gifts uh, rendered towards Sister Cynthia and myself during the fifth anniversary commemoration and as your pastor and first lady, we thank you. And we, we thank you. And you, we want you to know that you blessed us. And we say thank you. All right. I want to get back on track with the sermon from the mount. And we want to go to chapter 7. This is a teachable moment. This is one of these sermons where that are better taught than preached. All so right. this is a, a teachable moment. I want you to go with me when you get to chapter Seven, go to verse three. Mm -hmm. And there are some very profound and very provoking questions asked. Jesus asked, Why do you look at the speck? of sawdust in your brother's eye mm. and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. Mm. And then he asks another question. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. And then he says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye. Don't, don't miss that. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I want to talk this morning about uh, or sit around this subject. Improve yourself then help somebody else. Alright. 
improve yourself and, and then help somebody yeah. else. All right, let's see. The best way for me, I'm talking about me, to study the Word of God so that I comprehend it better, so that I understand what God is saying to me better is to begin each study session with questions mm -hmm. and not with assumptions. All right. You see, starting with questions is an admission that I do not fully understand what God wants me to know about His Word. All right. See, I, I don't know about you, but when, I'm talking about me now, when I study His Word, it really does not matter. Reverend Thomas, how many times I have read or recited or studied a passage of scripture. Yes, sir. At the moment that I am studying that scripture, somehow or another, the scripture that I am studying speaks to me in a clearer, and, 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 and I don't know about somehow or another, it speaks to me with an increase in clarity. I'm trying to, it, it, it becomes more relevant. I think that's what I'm trying to say. It becomes more important uh, uh, in that moment. All right. In other words, it speaks to my right now moment. Anybody ever, I don't know if you've ever experienced that. You, you, you read a passage of scripture and you've studied it for years and then all of a sudden you pick it up and you read it, you study it again, and all of a sudden it has this new profound meaning for your life. Yes, yes. As I study the Word of God in this season of my life, you know, I found myself having to unlearn things. Educators, uh, like King Thomas, you know how hard it is to unlearn something you you learn wrong. I find myself having to unlearn things I believe to be true. All right. But 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 as I study and and as I pray more in this season in my life, I realize that what uh yeah what what I I knew about the text was an incomplete understanding or a partial understanding. In other words, I learned it wrong or incompletely. All right. And I needed to improve my understanding of that text. And when I read it that time, somebody ought to be praying with me. It got a little clearer. It got, I gained a better understanding. And you see, admitting that my understanding was incomplete that was an important big step. It is an important big step in, in the life of a Christian. It was an important big step for me because in my walk, you understand, it actually opened up a door for me to change me. Yeah. Mm. And that's why I find starting my Bible study with questions. It's a good thing because it leads me to self-correction and self-correction allows me to walk closer with God. All right. It, it, it gives a whole uh, that is well that gives a, a whole new meaning to, to just a closer walk with thee. Yeah, yeah. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Anybody ever been there? Have you ever been there, college? Where well, you, you realize that daily walking closer to him, you just make a plea, let it be. Lord, That's right. 
fire inside Chad. My improved understanding is not a perfect understanding. I'm trying to help somebody here. You see, it's just a better, <laughs> it's just a better understanding. See, even though I got better, I did not reach perfection. I, I, I still didn't reach perfection. And though I got closer, I, I'm not there yet. Y'all need to see what I'm, I'm trying to say. And further, see, further confirmation that we must always, this, this passage of Scripture, this, this realization, this understanding is, is confirmation that, that we need to always trust in the Lord. And with all of our hearts and, and we don't need to be leaning on our own understanding because our understanding is incomplete. Oh, I need a I just need to hear a breath of amen. Just amen. To hear through the air. Just say something. See, see, yes, see you may ask why did I go there today? Be, uh, what made me go there today because see see I have read studied I have been taught and I have taught this text many times before and each time mm -hmm. I walked away believing that no one has the right to judge another one. All right. Nobody got a right to judge anyone else. Because you see all sin and, and we all have fallen short. Sure. Sure. I, I would walk away believing that all sin is sin. Mm -hmm. Because in the final judgment, God is the only judge that really dies. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, don't, don't need any offense to that judge. But at the end of the day, God's judgment is the only one that's going to really matter. Therefore, I, I have always believed that no individual has the authority to judge another individual. But this time, as I did this deep dive into this familiar and often quoted text, I learned that Jesus is actually saying something different. Mm. Watch this. Jesus is saying, we all sin. But all sins are not equal. Mm. I need to make a note on that. He's saying that we all sin, but all sins are not equal. All right, help us here. He, he's saying something else. He says there are big sins mm -hmm. and there are little sins. He, he's saying something else. He says after I have Judge and reduce my big sins, then I become qualified to judge your big sins and then help you reduce your big sins. All right. I may have to preach this one again real soon. <laughs> see, see, see let, let, let me say that a different way. See, the reference to seven deadly sins is a clue yeah. 
that all sins are not equal. All right. So you see, wrongly judging, I'm trying to help you now, wrongly judging is a sin. But it is not a deadly sin. I'm trying to help you. Do you, do you see this? See, 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 when Jesus preached against judgment, he was comparing big sins, the sins that lead to death, to little sins, those that do not lead to death. Yeah. See, to think, I'm trying to help you now, to think on adultery is a little sin. To commit adultery is a bigger sin. I'm trying to help you. See, see, see. Look, look, let, let, let's go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. When, when you go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, I need to take my time to slow down because I know this is this is a deep dive, and I know this is this is challenging some folks because I know how we have learned this over the years. But I want you to watch this. He says, "You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment." But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Mm -hmm. Then he says again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, rack up, and that means you empty headed idiot, is answerable to the Supreme Court, to the Sanhedrin Council. That's the little sin. You see? But he said, and anyone who says you fool, you are in danger of the fire of hell. That's a bigger sin. All right. I'm trying, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to help you. In other words, that's a nice way and, a, and an unnice way to call somebody. Well, let me move on. Yes, do, do, you, do you see what he's saying? Watch this, verse 27. Watch this. He said, You have heard that it was said. You shall not commit adultery. A big sin, that's a big sin against the body. But I say to you that anyone uh, so much as looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's the smallest sin. When you commit adultery, I'm trying to help you, when we commit adultery in our hearts, that's a smaller sin, but it is sin nonetheless. But when you go the extra step and you actually commit adultery, that's a bigger sin. Now, now watch this. Go, go, go look at Mark. Go, go look at Mark 7, 20 and, and Mark 7, chapter verse 20 and 23. I want, because when you see this, I, I, I'm not trying to prove this. I'm going to let the text prove it. It's, uh, 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 the text is going to watch what Watch what's said here. It says, uh, I want you to catch Jesus. Mark catch Jesus is further clarifying this point. He says, and he said, whatever comes from, from the heart of a man, that is what defiles and dishonor him. Mm -hmm. He says, for within... That is, out of the heart of men come wicked thoughts and schemes, All right. acts of sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, acts of greed and covetousness, wickedness, deceit, unrestrained conduct. In other words, living as though we have no boundaries. That ought to sound familiar. Envy, jealousy. Slander and profanity, arrogance and self-righteousness and foolishness, poor judgment. Jesus is giving a list of sins. But all these evil things, all these evil schemes, he says, and, and desires come from within and defile and dishonor the man. See, these sins, all of them are within us. And, and, and that's why we are always sinners. Do y'all see this? And, and when, when given birth, when they come 
from within us out to the world when we give birth to them, when they come out of us, they grow bigger. I'm trying to help you. Do you see? Do you see what's happening here? All sin is sin. But our indulgence, the level of our participation differs from person to person and from sin to sin. All right. May, 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 I, may, may I have your attention, please? That, that, that there are degrees of sin. All right. And, and Jesus is expressing this point in this text. Now, I got to tell you, I ain't seen it before. But, but he is expressing this very point in the text. Watch what he says. He said, why? Look at this. Look at the verb. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Now consider the size of a speck of sawdust. Mm. The size of a single Flake of dust, a speck that is so small, if it was in your eye, you probably wouldn't even notice it. Y'all ain't praying with me. In fact, when we walk outside this morning, all of us probably got us several specks of pollen got into our eyes. It was multiple specks, and we didn't even notice. Then he said, well, why do you look for something that small? Look at this now. In your brother's eye, and you are paying no attention to a two by four by eight plant in your own eye. Mm. Let me clarify this now. So you see, the use of a speck and a plant is metaphorical. In other words, it, it, it symbolizes something to make a point. It's a symbol to make a point. And the point that is being made is sin comes in sizes. From specks to planks. I'm trying to help you. It, it, sin comes inside and, and it makes no sense at all to be looking at some minor fault done by a brother when you are doing something much worse. See, it makes no sense to judge a brother for looking at a good-looking woman. I'm trying to help somebody. I'm trying to help a lot of us now, brothers. It, it, it makes no sense to be judging somebody doing some reckless eyeballing when you are cheating on your wife. Your brother's sin of looking is a speck as compared to your sin, which is a plank. How can you not only look at it, he come back and say, how can you even say it uh, to your brother? Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your eye. Right. How can you judge his sin that is so small you can't even see it? And how can you even fix your mouth to say anything to him about his sin while all the time you are doing what he is thinking? He calls on, on the carpet uh, the Pharisees. Just like he's calling us on the carpet with this message today. He calls us on the carpet about this. He says, you hypocrite. I didn't expect to get many amens on this one. 
this one. That's why I told y'all it was a teachable, yes, a teachable moment. So I, I know it, it just keep your keep your devices on and y'all stay with me. He said, "You hypocrite." Go ahead, Pastor. He said, first take the plank out of your own eye. In other words, improve yourself first. Get out of your own way. Improve yourself first. And then, this is interesting language. He says, you will see clearly. When you get that big plank out of your way, you can then see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Then you can help somebody else. Well, let, 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 me, let me help you with that. Those of us who've been around a while, we've done some things. Somebody ought to say it there. Amen. We've been in some places. Amen. We weren't supposed to be in. Amen. We, we, help me, Holy Ghost. We've done some things Amen. we weren't supposed to do. Amen. But whether it was age that stopped you or Jesus in your life, you don't do them anymore. Amen. Somebody ought to say it there. And, and, and because you don't do them anymore, you can now see clearly to tell a young brother or a young sister that you don't want to go down that road because I've been there before and when you go down that road, this is how you're going to break your leg. Y'all ain't praying for me. This is how you're going to bump your head. You have something that you can teach about the word of God. Lady Matthew, uh, in chapter 23, uh, Jesus uh, is chastising the Pharisees about that hypocrisy. He gets on them again and he calls them, watch this, blind guides. <laughs> you're blind guides. In other words, you are blind leaders. Thus he's saying the blind is leading the blind. Mm. And then he says to them, you straining your eyes to see a gnat. You straining your eyes to see the little sin and the other folks while you swallow an account. Do y'all see that? You, you, you strain your eyes to look at the fault of somebody else. Why you have eaten a whole cap of you, strain your eyes to see a net that's flying around the camera that you just ate. Wow. Uh, to be clear, the Bible, hear me on this, does not teach that we should not judge one another. Mm -hmm. That is not what the Bible is teaching us. The Bible teaches that we are to be righteous judges of one another. Now Paul clears this up in Romans chapter 2. He, in verse 1 he says, For in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. See, so you've got to stop practicing help me Holy it goes what you call yourself judge oftentimes I tell people you can tell but you can't teach unless you practice what you preach so, so Paul Paul is saying look before you get out there passing judgment on somebody else you need to know that what you practicing you ought to be judging that first well pastor how do I avoid how do I avoid this sin? Well, it's simple. Improve yourself first. Do a self assessment and self judgment and improve yourself first. And then help somebody else. Jesus says in John uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 24, he says, Do not judge by appearance. I want y'all to look at that. He said, don't judge by, don't, don't judge by, don't judge the book by the cover. 
but he said, but judge with right judgment. He does not say, do not judge. And when he does say it, he is saying it in the context of wrongful judgment. How you know that, guys? How you get that? How you get there? How do you get there? Well, it's simple. Just approve yourself first. You judge yourself. You turn. You, you look in the mirror and study through a glass. And you judge yourself first. And then you try to help somebody else. Paul explains further in Galatians 6, brothers and sisters. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. In other words, don't see them to look down on them. Uh, that, 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 that's the wrong way to look at them, but see them to help them. And then Paul goes on to warn against wrongful judgment. He says, but well, watch yourself now. He said, watch yourself or, or you may become tempted uh, to wrongly judge. And then he goes on to give some good advice. He says, carry each other's burden. Uh, in other words, remember just how far Jesus has brought you. You carry the other person's burden. And in, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And what's the law of Christ? Uh, that's the law of love. And if you, and if you do anything else, uh, he's saying that uh, thinking that you are uh, something, you're thinking that you're something you're not. If you do anything other than the law of love, you, you actually, yeah, thinking uh, that you're something that you're not and deceiving yourself. So instead, he says, each one should test their own action. In other words, we need to look at ourselves. Then they can take pride in themselves alone. In other words, once you do an assessment of yourself and you make some corrections, then you can be proud of your own accomplishment. But you can do that without comparing yourself to somebody else. Because each of us have our own loads to bear. Yes. Then he says, nevertheless, the one who receives instruction. I like this. I, I like this, Stephen Johnson, because <clears throat> watch what he says. He says, nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Now, 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 don't, don't miss that now. <clears throat> you should thus. All of us are students. And all of us are, are learning. And so the students should share what they have received more clearly. The students should share the clarity, the improvements in their understanding with the teacher. Thus, in the class, you got iron. Help me, Holy Ghost. Sharpening iron. And then finally, John explained something that literally jumped off the page during this study time for me. It was in 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 16 and 17. Y'all go back and look at these texts. I've been doing a lot of this from the, the Amplified for clarity. But look at what that says. It says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, watch this, that does not lead to death, He will pray and ask on the believers we have. And God will for him give life to those whose sin is not leading to death. Amen. There are sins that do not lead to death. There are sins that are not included in those seven deadly sins. Right. It's still sin. But, and we are supposed to help each other through those. He said, I do not say, I think this is important. I do not say that one should pray for this kind of sin, the ones that lead to death. 
He says, all wrongdoing is sin. Whether you are thinking it, he's not inconsistent with what Jesus is saying. He, he, this is, he, he, he is not inconsistent with what's been said before. He says, all wrongdoing is sin. And there is sin that does not lead to death. One can repent of it and be forgiven. There are sins that are deadly sins. And there are sins that are not deadly. All sin is sin. But all sin is not evil. There are big, I think I found something where there really are some big eyes and little you. When I look at my own sin, it ought to be a big eye. I'm trying to help somebody. And when I look at somebody else, it ought to be a little you. Get rid of my big eye. So I can help the little one you got. Improve yourself first. And then help somebody else. Now, I'm done. Uh, yeah. Um, and I know that um, some feel a little sting from that message. Amen, somebody. Uh, because as I was preparing it, I was whooping myself. So somebody ought to recognize. Uh, yeah. But, you know what? It blessed me. The blessing. Amen. Improve yourself. And then help somebody else. Amen. But when we render help, don't do it as to judge. To talk about, to talk down to someone. Amen. But do it as to help them. Yeah. And to lift them up. Father, we come right now thanking you for your word and thank you for just a little more clarity and understanding. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And now, in the name of Jesus, we ask for all who found it not robbery to listen, grant us the courage to behave as you will. Give us the courage to behave as Christians, to walk in the light, the beautiful light. Oh, we give you praise and glory for everything you've already done, what you're doing right now and what you shall do. And this is the prayer, this is our petition in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The doors of the church stand open. They never close. Anytime you're on the surface, anytime you see a member of Ebenezer, just let us know. You want Jesus and you want to be a part of this congregation. We'll be glad to point you in the right direction. We'll point you to the cross. Amen. We'll, uh, the doors of the church stand open right now.
I'm going to Dr. C.D. Scott has over at the Mount Aaron Missionary Baptist Church. He says, when you take that whooping from the Word, uh, it'll be all right in the morning when the swelling goes down. Amen. Amen. All right, so we thank God for His Word. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, uh, this, this series on the sermon, coming from the Sermon on the Mount, has really blessed me. There's so much meat. There's so much meaning, so much power. In it. We've just been walking through uh, the message and its meaning. Jesus, uh, you, you begin, when you read it, the first few times, it looks like he's all over the place, but from the every paragraph to paragraph, there's continuity. One leads to the other. It's amazing uh, how beautifully presented uh, that sermon is. So as we prepare to leave this place with number 1490, follow the clock. You can hear this service. WHBB, uh, remember 334-875-1382 if you desire to become a part of this sanctuary. This sanctuary, this, this baptized body of believers, just give us a call, 334-875-1382. Uh, message us on our page. Uh, visit our YouTube page. We got one of those too. Y'all like our page and like our Facebook and page and, and, and share the message. And those of you who are on, share uh, the message on Facebook and share the YouTube message. Uh, be assured that when you do, God will bless you because you are now helping to get the word out. What thus says the Lord. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, to present your fallness before his presence. With exceeding joy, the only wise God, our Savior, be glory 